Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very, very much. I want to thank uh, Susanna and Meta and Science for Peace uh, for this evening and for getting me out of Beit Zetun. <laughs> Usually on a Wednesday evening or a Thursday evening or any other evening, I'm at Beit Zetun. So thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for the gracious invitation and for being here uh, on this cold, cold night. I'm very honored and pleased to be here, honored because Science for Peace has a long and distinguished history in the academic and peace movement in Canada. And some of its members were among my teachers from undergraduate years in this very building. I am pleased also because members are also supporters of Zatun and Beit Zetun. I am grateful because it's an opportunity to explore an area of great interest to me and relevance to my activist work. Not being in the academic world, I do not often get the time or space to delve deeply into a subject. Only enough time to get to the next development, the next outrage, the next fire. When I was asked to speak on the general heading of nonviolence in civil society within a series called Vital Discussions of Human Security, I immediately said yes. I learned a while ago that this is an excellent way for me to learn and to develop. By being asked to speak on a topic, I am challenged to think more deeply and to express my thoughts more fully, clearly, and responsibly. And you can be the judges of that in about an hour. I guess in this respect, I've not progressed beyond my undergraduate years, needing the discipline of a date and an audience to get serious and do the work. I suspect that I am being asked to be here tonight out of my work in the past 12 plus years around Israel-Palestine, and particularly the specific approach I have taken with Zatun, which is the Arabic word for olive, which I founded in 2004 to import and sell fair trade olive oil from Palestine as a way to connect North Americans to the reality of Palestinians. And then Beit Zatun, House of Olive, which opened its doors basically six years ago, in January 2010, as a culture center, a gallery, and a community meeting space to promote the interplay of art, culture, and politics to, as a way to explore issues of social justice and human rights, both locally and internationally. And in those years, I've learned a great deal and met a great many people and so many topics and subjects, especially at Beit Zetun, with over 900 events. You may expect from this background that I will focus and speak a great deal about Palestine Israel, but in fact it will be very little because the topic tonight is much larger and all-encompassing. Palestine is but one instance, albeit a very important one, of what ails the world, including us here in this place at this time. People who attend Beit Zetun often hear me say, the roots are in Palestine, but the tree is global justice. What I have learned in the course of the many diverse and often very human, politically and socially intense events in <clears throat> is how much I do not know, at least not the critical details or even the specific questions. I often sit at Beit Zetun events discouraged by how much I do not know or can ever hope to know without a huge investment in time and effort. And even then, it is questionable what good it will do. One thing I realize out of this is that in too many instances, we are simply arguing our ignorances, perhaps rationally and with great skill, but ultimately hopelessly and mindlessly. Confusion is the result and frustration that little was truly communicated and even less elucidated. On the positive side, the other thing I've come to realize is in some respects, all you really need to know or need to have is a small collection of big questions. This to me is more interesting, profitable, and applicable to a wide range of subjects, geographies, and conflicts. I revel in the question being, being asked, <clears throat> uh, or more accurately, to formulate the right question or to witness the, pop, the proper question being asked. This for me is the key because it sets the frame for the larger discussion and answer. <clears throat> the larger discussion and answer, whether it is meaningful or a waste of time. I'm always reminded of one of my favorite quotations 
Uh, it is taken from the 1973 book entitled Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Pinchon. And he says, if they get you to ask the wrong question, the answers don't matter. <laughs> so you can say my coming here tonight is to ask questions. I hope they are interesting and profitable ones. Let's get back to our heading for tonight, nonviolence and civil society. And why did it grab my attention? The topic grabbed my attention immediately. But what do I know about these two topics? And what can I contribute tonight? Although I've been clearly and deeply engaged in aspects of both, working to create and encourage civil society in Toronto through Beit Zetoun, and working nonviolently for Palestine awareness and solidarity using the olive oil, the universal symbol of peace, I consider myself no expert on either, certainly not from an academic standpoint. It is only from my, from my doing in the community, near and far, working with people that I feel I can speak. Tonight is more of a sharing than a lecture, although I'm, you might be confused between lecture and sharing here. But. <laughs> and what of the connection to peace? Most simply, nonviolence and civil society for this group and for the peace movement have come to be the most closely associated with peacework or peacemaking. They are the acknowledged and accepted midwives and handmaidens to peace. Clearly, I subscribe to the equation of nonviolence in civil society leading to peace, having founded Beit Zetoun to create, encourage, and nurture civil society in Toronto, and using Beit Zetoun to bring ways and means of nonviolent expression and resistance to Palestine Israel, the undisputed champion of intractable conflict. I am pleased and proud of the work and its accomplishments. <clears throat> Oddly enough, I am much more confident about having something to say about the obverse, namely violence and uncivil society, and their negative influence on peace. Maybe it is my contrarian side seeking expression. It seems to me that thinking of violence and uncivil society is more profitable, at least for this talk, to get us to our goal of nonviolence and civil society. I say this because our world for the recent past, present, and foreseeable future seems to be characterized more and more by marked violence and an expansion of uncivil behavior in virtually all spheres. I'm no Einstein, but he did say, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes thinking about solutions. That is why I've titled the talk as I have. Violence and Uncivil Society, the Unmaking of Peace. Peace is the holy grail of our time. It is the most sought after state of being in society and yet seemingly the least attainable. Is it rareness that makes it so desirable, much like diamonds? Or is it merely a question of supply and demand? Continuing with the analogy of the market, I ask the question, what are the fundamentals of peace? What are its future prospects? Would you invest in peace? The first is a very real question, and the second a rhetorical one. Before we get to answer these central questions for tonight, I want to step back and look at the elements of the Holy Trinity, nonviolence, civil society, and peace. Of the three, I consider the fulcrum point to be civil society. It is where I think the equation succeeds or fails, where peace is made or unmade. Christians, especially Catholics, versed in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, will see the parallels of three in one. Each is so intertwined and indivisible from the other. We can intellectually examine each, but they are a totality, an equation. Christian call it, Christians call it the mystery of the Trinity. But in the earthly world, nonviolence, civil society, and peace should not be a mystery. And yet, they should, that they should have failed so consistently to be realized is a mystery and also a crime. The term civil society presents a challenge to work with because the word civil is difficult to define or limit as it refers to so many aspects, all having to do with city, life, objects, processes, relationships, laws, etc. When we say civil, we can mean many different things and it creates confusion. The word is Latin in origin, meaning of or pertaining to city, and, has had, and it has an earlier counterpart from the Greek polis, also meaning city. 
Thus, the deep interconnection between citizen and politics, as in the city and the polis. In English, civil is the root of many disparate uses and meanings, and here are a few. Civic virtue, civility, citizen, civil action, civil lawsuit, civilian, civilian population, civil affairs, civil rights, civil disobedience, civil engineering, civil law, civil liberties, a civil wedding even, the civil service, of course our civil society, and civil war, among many others. It is a great and thrilling constellation, and a question for etymologists or linguists. Is there another word in the English language that qualifies and modifies so many nouns? They are all somewhat related and refer to aspects of civil, yet different and specific to their operating space, their intent, and direct relevance to tonight's discussion. Please bear with me as I use the word civil at times, referring to many aspects. The ones that are of greatest interest for us here tonight are four. Civil as in citizen, civil as in positive, moral, personal, and socialized behavior, civil society as in NGO, non-governmental organizations, that is outside of government and corporate circles, civic as in structures and processes that engage the citizen in their life and duty. What is civil society? Civil society is something we all pretty much esteem and think of as a valuable element in human and political arena. In fact, we often think it is the missing link or the missing element which might right what is wrong in our world politic. In many respects, civil society has more or less come to mean the NGO world, the independent, unconnected collective and non-governmental organizations or agencies. To a large degree, this, is, this also excludes private and public corporate entities. So what, have le what is left is primarily nonprofit organizations outside of the establishment of power of government and corporations, <coughs> typically with a mission or an agenda to protect and advance the public good. For many, we ho as we hope, the prayer is that civil society will help us, that it will save us. The general thinking being that having more diverse input into the system or political process will bring a much needed balance, leading to better decisions for a greater number of people in more diverse communities. Civil society will be the counterbalance to bureaucratic control grab of government and the profit greed of corporations. Also, it is expected that civil society is the public's guarantor against the collusion of the other two, which seems to be more and more the case in this country and elsewhere in the world. But more importantly for us, civil society is marked by not relying on violence in the way that government and corporations seem to, in different ways, uh, to, um, to they seem to default to violence as their main enforcement tool when other methods fail. The problem is actually worse than the violence as the thing. Violence, although horrendous, what is more pernicious and vicious than violence is the presumed right to be violent in the name of this or that claim of common good. Our hope and expectation is that true civil society will be above using violence as default method or tool and will make no claim to the right to be violent, recognizing violence as the ultimate admission of defeat. Hence, our salutary and praiseworthy heading of nonviolence and civil society. Were it to be so straightforward, not that the above is not true or possible, except that practice in contemporary history does not bear this out. For our purposes, I would like to define civil service or civil society as meaning primarily an environment where citizens or the mentality and values and practices of citizenship can happen. Of course, this is much greater than the very limited passport piece of paper definition that the Harper government has tried to instill in the last 10 years. The last 40 years have seen the steady erosion of the citizen. And for the, for the most part, it has lost its meaning and value. We rarely hear it spoken except in Harper's mechanical way as holder of a passport. In the media and government in general, we are only taxpayers or consumers 
and maybe if we're lucky, contributing producers of meaningful services and products. Uncivil society is simply a collection of individuals rather than citizens united for the common good. It is indeed the epitome of Orwellian doublespeak that the US Supreme Court ruled in 2010 uh, in favor of political action committees that unleashed unlimited funding for in, uh, individual politicians and undoing whatever democracy there was. That ruling was called Citizens United. <laughs> to my mind, what is most fundamental to civil, so civil society is clear-headed, open-hearted, and goodwill active citizenship. No amount of NGO activity will make up for an engaged citizenry. Is it possible to have such a citizenry? Definitely not in the current environment we have, and maybe not ever to the extent and depth that we would like to see it. But we know that the public good will not ever happen without civil mindedness. Civil society understood as more than NGOs has been eroded. And, and in such an environment, one cannot reali realistically expect peace to service or spontaneously generate. Rather, without it, we can count, we can count for public life to almost spontaneously combust into chaos. We can say that that is already happening in almost all areas of society and public life as it's falling, uh, failing around us. My main message tonight is that the peace movement should look to generating not peace directly, but to promote and model civil and civic mindedness through a full and robust identity and practice of, future, of true citizenship operating in a civil and civic space. Returning to the market analogy, I ask the questions, what are the fundamentals of peace? And what are its future prospects? Would you invest in peace? Of course, we are invested heavily in peace as people of goodwill, interested in the well-being of the planet and its inhabitants, all of them, regardless of color, creed, or tradition. However, as a movement looking for results, looking for a return on our massive investment of time, energy, and emotion, what are we getting back? Are things getting better by doing more of the same? Here we come to the essential message of tonight. As individuals interested in peace and working within a movement to promote and advance peace among nations, and now somehow in the last 20 years expand it to so-called civilizations, we need to recognize that we have had very mixed results. Personally, I would say worse than that. Some small successes offset by some huge setbacks. On the net basis, I think it's wise to reevaluate the movement's objectives and measures of success, refocus our goals, and reexamine the strategies and actions. Of course, we are not giving up the piecework, but hopefully going about it differently. Essentially, the peace movement needs to step back. I want to be clear here that I'm not advocating uh, a prescription as such. but an, ex an exploratory challenge to seek new objectives and new approaches to achieve not peace directly, but first to build what I'm calling the fundamentals for peace with the expectation that peace will follow. I do not mean to be contentious, but for the sake of tonight, let's say that peace has had very limited success. My point is that we cannot pursue peace or economic well-being for that matter directly without getting the fundamentals right. Yes, one can pretend, fabricate, spin, manipulate, inflate, outright lie, placate, pad, fudge, ignore, divert. <laughs> These are all techniques and tricks to cover up for integral failures, and sooner and later, the bubble bursts and the ugly lie flows out. Just as some can game the economy, one can game peace as well. Each is a form of fraud that eventually bursts with disastrous consequences. They are fraternal Ponzi schemes. I want to make a note here. I'll be using examples from economics not because I'm an economist or a lover of economic thinking, but I find it works as a communication tool. People somehow get it. And maybe it's not so mysterious 
as in the last 40 years, our economic literacy has vastly outrun our peace and humanity's literacy. As you can tell, I'm probably going too fast because I want to get to questions and answers because I really enjoy those. <laughs> this, this less so, perhaps. I believe the best we can do as an organized movement of individuals interested in peace is to look for the fundamentals <coughs> that underlie a reality or set of structures and work to transform them to build new ones with partners and have the patience and foresight to stay with them to fruition. I'm not suggesting that we throw anything out, only to examine and refocus our perspective and understanding of the hurdles to peacemaking. I'm here to challenge in a small way what we mean by piecework and how we think of violence. Violence is not only, the, only that of war or terrorism. These two media grabbers are not the cause of violence, but rather manifestations or the necessary consequences of a deeper violence. In fact, we, and by we, I don't know exactly how to define we, have managed in the last 25 years, especially since the fall of the Soviet Union, to combine and fuel endless flow of war and terror, and certainly this, the greatest violence we have ever encountered in the Orwellian phrasing, war on terror, which has only fueled greater militarization, um, policing, guns and drugs, austerity, rioting, degradation of the planet, and erosion of civil society. The only true or, or, or long-lasting benefit I can think of is ringing the alarm bells ever louder to wake us up before it is too late. I believe that violence perpetrated in our personal, emotional, and social being is the violence that makes possible the outward violence. The inner violence is so prevalent and real, and yet unchallenged for the sake of, in the name of, or in the name of entertainment, releasing stress, ego gratification, freedom of choice in the marketplace, and the like. Civility, society, and peace rest on the respect of the other. At its most basic, violence is, is an individual or group setting is essentially the denial of respect of a person's life, rights, norms, identity, or essential human worth. The internal violence gets fed into our civil mind and civic environments, disrupting our capacity to act or demand more or aspire for better, and ultimately enables the national and the foreign violence we export to other parts of the world. We feed the monster of inner violence. Here we can look at a First Nation story of two wolves living in each of us. One evening, a grandfather was speaking to his grandson, telling him a story about a battle that goes on inside of people. He said, my son, the battle is between two wolves inside each of us. One is evil. It is anger, envy, jealousy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, and ego. The other is good. It is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. The grandson thought about it, and then he asked, which wolf wins? And the grandfather simply replied, the one you feed. It seems that of all, of that all the countless and many instruments of power are, ge are geared to feed the wolf of violence. And most of it disguised as very innocently that it slips into our conscious. The result is that we live in a deeply ailing and alienating society. Our illness is incivility, morally destructive patterns of self-absorption, callousness, manipulativeness, and materialism so entrenched in everyday life and behavior that we're not conscious, let alone seeking to, he to heal it. And self-help courses are usually of the kind that do not contribute to a solution. If anything, they promote further illness. We see untold numbers of examples of uncivil behavior in every, in every sphere of human activity, supported by all the structures and tools of power. If I am to catalog a few examples of the violence, that erodes our civility. Um, here they are. The ubiquitous gun culture, despite ever-frequent mass shootings, 
locally and globally. This, even here in Canada, the scrapping of the gun registry, uh, the, the extreme violence of video games, the graphic violence and meanness of Hollywood films and the special effects, Hollywood portrayals of justice and bravado leading to the good guys, bad guys reality, even the proposed um, snitch line for barbaric practices, the inability to discuss or exchange views due to rabid partisanship, which has become the new patriotism, which Samuel Johnson in the 18, 1700s once called the last refuge of the scoundrel. Social media incivility. Many sites, including the Toronto Star, have permanently removed the comment section because of the disgraceful and uncivil discourse. 1-800-JUSTICE ads plastered on TTC buses by slip and fall lawyers promoting litigious societies for their own gain. Once, and, and, and um, in wartime, snipers are glorified, the new heroes. It used to be the infantrymen, then the fighter pilot, and now it is the drone pilots going home for dinner every night after their dastardly work. Over-policing and militarization of the police. We have seen so much of that in the last two years, Sami Yatin and all the black lives that have been lost in the United States and in Toronto. The behavior of politicians in, the, in Congress and the legislatures in Canada and P Queen's Park. Um, Donald Trump and the entire Republican presidential slate. <laughs> and not to leave out Hillary. <laughs> I think she just happens to be a little bit more discreet and waiting, waiting for her time to pounce. <laughs> On an individual level, the rise in road rage incidences and giving the finger, commercializations of drones as household items, as playthings. And this is my all-time favorite, uh, the sale of your very own personal flamethrower. <laughs> You can buy one for $1,200. You can light, the, you know, the, 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 light the candles on your Christmas tree. I don't know how you can do that, but it is, it's insane. So in such a daily feed of glorified wall-to-wall -wall big and small violences, is it any wonder that we do not have peace, either at home, on the street, or in the world? I am forever mystified at one level, but not at all on another. But how difficult it seems to be to achieve peace in one place, in one sector, among one group, before non-peace seems to erupt somewhere else. It is like the carnival game, Rock the Mole. If you're not familiar with it, I guess carnivals are of another era. <laughs> um, it's a board game with many holes where a stuffed toy pops out of the hole one at a time, and the object of the game is to whack them with a hammer at ever faster speeds until there are no more moles. No sooner that one mole is whacked with the hammer that another springs up from another hole on the board. And here you're invited to think of Zbigniew Brzezinski's grand chessboard. <laughs> and that's, that's the strategy and the concept that has guided foreign policy, American foreign policy, for the last 40 years. From this image, you get the idea of ultimate futility and, uh, dest and destructiveness. Evidently, the approach is not working for the greatest number of people or nations in the greatest number of places on the map. One can see this in the Middle East, especially in Israel-Palestine, where each step takes us down further in the hole. Maybe the forces handling the hammer are not very interested in peace, but rather have a greater interest in just whacking the mole. It reminds me of the faulty road map that, has never in, that was never intended to get to a destination called peace. Frankly, the thought of another road map from Washington or London or Brussels is sickening to me. Yet they will churn them out with the same sorry formula. Sorry for the vast majority of the world, great for some infinitesimal minority. And the wheel of fortune spins again, only to stop at the same spot again. The very vast majority of ordinary people of the world desire peace. They value justice and fairness, yet their leaders seem unable to deliver. Is it that leaders who are to blame are and simply need to be fired? Well, that seems to happen from one election to another, but things only seem to get only marginally better or a whole lot worse. We are still waiting for a whole lot better. As an aside, I'm very pleased, as I'm sure many of you are, that Harperism has officially ended. 
and that Trudeau has ushered a new or at least hoped for new era. And one of the biggest bonuses for Trudeau was the apparent civility of his person, his campaign, and the influence on his party. Obviously, Canadians were aware, if only dimly, of the illness and responded positively to Trudeau and have great expectations. He has made civility in question period a goal. Imagine how bad things must have been for civility to be an election promise. <laughs> As the song goes, looking for love in all the wrong places, can it be we're looking for peace in all the wrong places? Or at least in all the wrong ways? From our 50-year track record, I think we need to heed that song. Of course, the, the question is, what are the better, more promising, productive ways to find peace? And here, I think, is the key element in the core of our talk. Violence and civil society, the unmaking of peace. A non-civil society hampers the development of peace because it enables our so-called leaders and other forces to avoid doing what is necessary for peace. A non-civil society actually works against peace. It actively undermines the fundamentals for peace. Respect, responsible behavior, freedom of individual, and characters, characteristics such as honesty, integrity, truth and generosity, and community spirit. spirit. All qualities of citizen working in the general, for the general good and general interest. Uncivil society works to encourage self-interest as paramount and the main driver for decisions and attitudes. Clearly, the fundamentals for peace are either weak or simply not present. Just as a national economy cannot realistically perform when it lacks the fundamentals, peace is the same. Politicians have learned with the help of economists and, and bankers to game the economy. With the help of think tanks and the security complex, um, the politicians have also learned to game peacekeeping and peacemaking. So what are the fundamentals? In an economy, it is the combination of real production and services delivered at good wages and more or less fairly distributed among workers and also with capital. I would say that for peace, it is a general sense of effective justice and civility distributed among local populations and nations. Do we have that in Canada, in the United States, anywhere in the world? If the answer is no, how can we expect to find or have peace, and by extension, nonviolence. A non-civil society is inherently violent, and I would say the obverse is also true. A violent society is inherently uncivil. This, I believe, is the key to understanding our lack of success of finding sustained peace and our movement's failure to make or build peace long term. We have had conflicts and wars for much of human history, but I would say never as we do now and never in the mean, callous, and calculating way. I see a correlation, albeit this is not an empirical based statement, between our level of violence and uncivil behavior and the wars being waged all over the planet. A prerequisite for continuous war between or among nations is to base, base, base it on war of all against all, which is a general attitude of distrust and of fear of every person against their very neighbor let alone someone 1,500 kilometers away, or 15,000 kilometers away. One way to do this is to instill or create a culture of personal and societal violence of uncivil society. Here by uncivil I mean the most basic humankind, not the political kind, although both can be considered valid here. One way of getting uncivil society, personal behavior wise, is to erode civil society, the political kind. That sounds confusing, but. We'll just pass it. <laughs> In this mode, citizens become taxpayers, become consumers, and finally competitors at war with each other in the marketplace of scarcity. In any mode other than citizen, we have no political or civil rights. As, pax, as taxpayers, our only right is to expect value for our taxes, not that we get any. As consumers, to spend our money on, a, on the free choice between three or four near identical cell phone plans. As producers, we get to choose between non-existing or low-paying or eroding and precarious jobs. 
and all is floating on a sea of civil and soul-crushing debt. Lost in all in this in the all is lost is the all-important social impulse for cooperation founded on respect and appreciation of mutuality and reciprocity. In a marketplace, instead of a true civic place, either in attitude or actual behavior, all becomes negotiable and transient, impermanent and precarious. In such an environment, peace at home and abroad is not possible, and whatever exists is a veneer to be po poked through at the first excuse. And talking about thin veneer, at this point I wish to make an extended commentary about something I feel very strongly about, and is the thin veil of civilization. We see it, we see civilization as it is, is derived from the word civil, and the word encapsulates the totality of political, social, cultural, moral practice, identity, values, espoused by an entity, usually in a prescribed space or time, such as Western or Eastern civilization, Greek or Roman, Judeo-Christian or Muslim, modern or ancient. Here also lies one of the dangers of civil, of the word civil, lending its good name and reputation. In civilization, I find the most pernicious and manipulative use of the positive connotations of civil. Of course, it's not just the word. It is how we use and the usage of words that is problematic. Civilization has come to be an enemy of peace, especially in a name right out of a Hollywood script the clash of civilization, used by Bernard Lewis in 1990 and later taken up by Samuel Huntington, speaking to the American, surprise, surprise, speaking at the American Enterprise Institute in 1992. That self-serving, facile worldview has opened a vicious Pandora's box that we seem incapable of escaping 25 years later. Civilization has been used to indelibly frame a destructive polarity of good guys versus bad guys. Incredible to hear, but the most powerful leader in the world, President Obama, uses these very terms routinely to explain national policies and actions. Presumably, when you call a group bad guys, nothing more needs to be said. To illustrate the constant and inescapable incul inculcation of bad guys, I recently saw the Hollywood action blockbuster Mad Max Fury Road. <laughs> it was available at the library, and I just Okay. By the way, the French title is much, much better and more prophetic. It's Road to Chaos. <laughs> I could not help being flabbergasted by the simple-minded and barefaced imagery and parallels with ISIS. Desert landscapes, endless lines of trucks with fearless, bloodthirsty fighters riding bareback. Basically gasoline-guzzling monster car chases in the midst of fuel-starved chaos and savagery. A frightful leader with a nubile harem selling his brainwashed fighters a one-way ticket to Valhalla, an eternal glory in paradise, presumably with 72 virgins. <laughs> the entire premise of the film is saving the women. Where have we heard that before? And Max, the outsider, the strong, deadly, but basically helpful, good-hearted, silent type <laughs> just the man to do the job. If it wasn't so powerful and taken so deeply into our conscious, its violence would be a glaring setup, a genius parody of the clash of civilization fraud, which has brought us to an adrenaline-driven, hellish plot revolving around a destroyed planet and a war of all against all. The population is portrayed as a mass of starved, powerless, deprived, emaciated, mindless, and brain atrophied people incapable of thought or action, just happy for drops of water and the beneficence of the fearful, omnipotent, demented, and self-absorbed leader and guardian class. But this is no setup, no parody. For me, it is a serious picture of soul violence perpetrated on every person, despite the claims to the contrary. It's only a movie. It's just great entertainment with fantastic visual effects. It's Fury Road, the present and the future, the most uncivil behavior imaginable in the clash of civilization. The concept of civilization is all wrong and wrong-headed, full of hubris and pomposity, self-importance and self-power. It is manifest destiny gone totally mad and deadly. Clash of civilization is the epitome 
of the uncivil. It is the unlimited use of power in search for power over others. Civil, on the other hand, I think, and I think most of us would agree, is power with others. This dichotomy of power with versus power over is drawn from the work of Adam Kahane in his book, Power and Love, A Theory and Strategy for Social Change, where he talks that in each of us is the dialectic of love and power. Love seeks the unity with others and power the realization of self at the expense of others. And the conflict that naturally arises trying to keep them in balance so that we can try that we can move forward in a healthy and responsible way. Martin Luther King captured, captures it poetically and powerfully. Power without love is reckless and abusive. And love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. And justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love. I want to acknowledge Martin Luther King here for introducing justice into this picture. Without getting into another larger discussion, I think justice is the glue that unites and guides. We have another view of the same dynamic in the First Nations story recounted earlier of the two wolves inside of each of us. Civilization lets loose the wolf of power, and civilness feeds the wolf of love. Civilization divides through power over and civilness unites through power with. I hope you can join me in saying less civilization and more civilness. To wrap up, we try to answer our questions. What are the fundamentals of peace? What are its future prospects? And would you invest in peace? The holy grail of peace is yet to be birthed. And the midwives of civil society and nonviolence are proving to be anemic and incredibly overwhelmed. The current reality is the exact opposite. A more or less permanent non-peace holding sway over the entire planet with its ever ready and capable enabling tools, violence, and uncivil society. What is a peace movement to do? First, it needs to be honest and self-reflective of the reality it inhabits and the results of the approaches it has taken in the last 50 years. Second, it needs to begin to introduce new thinking, new partners, new approaches to the mix of tools and activities. <coughs> At the center, we need to rethink civil society. In its present form or place, in the constellation of power, civil society as a collection of NGOs has the feel of an alliance of the disenfranchised trying to break through for a seat at the table. Recently, I heard something on CIUT which has become a favorite. It goes like this. If you're not at the table, you are on the menu. <laughs> I found it such a powerful image, the most succinct metaphor for world order and hegemonic thinking. To my mind, it is, a really, it is really a form of state cannibalism and, by extension, of civil society and citizens. Clearly, this is the principle that has governed international affairs, and now, more and more, it is seeping into all levels, national, provincial, municipal, and corporate. Civil society is like wanting to get off the menu to sit at the table. It is indeed laudable, but civil society as a collection of NGOs facing off against government and corporate power is not enough, not by a million years. How does the public get off the menu? A very difficult question, of course, because of the enormous asymmetrical power of being on the table versus being on the menu. <laughs> Logically, when, stru when stuck in a paradigm, the only way out is to look for a new, hopefully superior paradigm. That is, one without a menu to be on. How realistic is that? That's another question. Of course, I do not have the answer. I don't know if anyone truly does. But we need to do it differently. We must break out of the patterns that hold us down. To me, the best way is what I have been trying to do at Beit Zetun, which, which is to create mutual awareness across our many and varied issues and geographies and circumstances, and build solidarity for each other. Beit Zetun is a limited venture, small, under, and unresourced, and very vulnerable to the marketplace of gentrification and cost of operations, and supporters greater 
or growing precariousness and reduced means. The peace movement needs to join forces with the labor movement, with fair wage advocates, with climate justice groups, with any and all for the advancement of a truly civil society founded, <coughs> founded on civic process and structures that grant, enable, encourage citizenship behavior and reward participation by making the government process truly transparent and effective and does not rely on a monopoly <coughs> of violence. Only then will the fundamentals with those fundamentals, can peace become a possibility for more than a nanosecond? And of course, we are invested in peace and ever hopeful, regardless of its chances and failures, because in a just peace is the only true achievement of our human family and meaningful life on this planet. Thank you. Bravo.